Welcome to Stonewall at 50, a new CUNY TV digital series celebrating Pride 2019. I'm Donna Hanover, and I am here with Patrick Pacheco, best-selling author of American Theatre Wing and Oral History, and he writes frequently about LGBTQ issues. Patrick, people would be surprised at how far back you can go if you're asked the question, what are the seminal plays about the LGBTQ experience? It's extraordinary. You can actually go back to 1926 in a play called The Captive, which had just the most veiled reference whatsoever to lesbianism, totally off stage, and yet it was busted on a morals charge, brought up on charges that were later dismissed. What's significant about that is that the lead actress was a woman named Helen Menken, who later led the American theater wing. The Captive got busted the same night as Sex by Mae West and both were brought up on morals charges, wow. and both were dismissed. And it made Mae West a tremendous star. I know that you've said it's very hard to winnow it down, but in the modern era, there are four plays that are really significant. Uh, the Boys in the Band, Tort Song Trilogy, The Normal Heart, and Angels in America, right? That's absolutely true. Uh, there's a whole list of other ones, of course, uh, that we can talk about. But in the interest of time, it's best to sort of concentrate and focus on that because they had a tremendous impact both on the gay community and the public at large. So what has happened to the gay play in the last 50 years? The short answer, Donna, is that it's grown up. It's gone from internalized, self-loathing homophobia to uh, triumphant, um, uh, don't mess with me uh, power. It's gone from being defined by our sexuality to plays about love, intimacy, compassion, marriage, and even gay adoption. It's gone from casts of actors who were afraid that if they were in a gay play, their careers would be ruined to cast of actors who are proud to be in a revival of a gay play like Boys in the Band, which was an all-gay cast. And it's gone from playwrights who happen to be gay writing about gay-themed plays that are as universal as anything else out there. So the Boys in the Band actually premiered off-Broadway the year before Stonewall, 68. Right? That, that's right. It was a tremendous ground breaking play. Uh, nobody had ever seen anything like it. The images of gay prior to that, in terms of entertainment, were people like Paul Lind, Liberace, and Charles Nelson Riley. So to be confronted with a bunch of gay men in an Upper East Side apartment celebrating a birthday, in which there was a school teacher, yes, an interior designer, uh, and a, a, a whole host of different professionals gathered together in one room talking about their relationships, talking about sexuality, and uh, is sort of presenting for the first time um, homosexuality in a way that had never quite been seen before. It became a cause celebre with people like Jackie Kennedy Onassis coming down to see it and bringing her socialite friends with Truman Capote, with, uh, with everybody else coming down to this small off-Broadway play. And it went on for quite a long time, two or three years. The playwright Mark Crowley uh, was very brave in doing that. And what was significant about it is that, yes, it was bitchy, and yes, it was self-loathing, and there was a line by the lead actor, Michael, who is the host of the party, that says, if only we can learn not to hate each other so much. And that sparked a great controversy within the gay community. Fast forward to 1978, Torch Song Trilogy. What was that about? The interesting thing about what Harvey Firestein did is you're absolutely right. It started at the, all these off-off-Broadway theaters, La Mama International Study. It was a three-part uh, epic uh, starring, again, a drag queen, a torch singer played by Harvey Firestein. It brought him to the public consciousness in a huge way. And it sort of just sort of eked out this existence. It was playing to half houses, John Glines, who was one of the early pioneers of gay theater, picked it up, supported it, gave Harvey money to continue it, 
Ellen Stewart at La Mama helped nurture it as well. It was a three-part epic that you would have thought would never see the light of day on Broadway. And yet in 1982, it was brought to Broadway, and not only was it had a long run on Broadway, but it also won the Tony Award. And its themes, again, were from somebody who was out and proud and wanted to show that, as Harvey says uh, in his character, people think that homosexuals cannot love. And that play was all about the love that he had for this bisexual man who was trying to decide whether he was going to stay with his wife or go with Harvey's character. And also the love that he and his mother had, as contentious as it was, and also the love that he had for a young gay teen that he adopted, who in the original production was played by Matthew Broderick. So uh, these were new themes that were coming up in 82, and it went all the way to win a Tony Award as Best Play and also a Tony Award for Harvey Firestein in the lead role. And again, it was groundbreaking. And again, it showed the general public an image of gay men that they had never had before. The gay men are capable of love and that they are capable of marriage and adoption. And that was 37 years ago. And then <clears throat> the AIDS epidemic struck. And what we have is the normal heart. Larry Kramer. Right. This was fascinating because in the midst of this epidemic that was killing gay men and other communities as well, the Haitian community, and in this autobiographical play, Larry Kramer, the author, looks back at a time when he created the gay men's health crisis with other people in the midst of this terrifying epidemic. And what had occurred at that time is that Larry was absolutely balls out uh, uh, activist in terms of calling the government um, to task, uh, indicting it in the most ferocious language for its inability to address the AIDS crisis, both the federal government and the Ed Koch um, you know, city government. Larry Kramer was even mad at the gay men's health crisis. There was this tension uh, between Larry Kramer is this sort of Old Testament prophet screaming about the AIDS epidemic that was just really in, three years into its terrifying run um, about both toward the gay community and to the general public that they were not paying it sufficient attention. And this was pitted against other uh, people who wanted a more conciliatory approach. They thought they could get more progress against what was a death sentence. If you had AIDS, you had it. It was a death sentence. It Absolutely. was beyond, it was beyond terrifying. What came next about five years down the road was Angels in America by Tony Kushner. It was this political and philosophical seven-hour epic in two parts that Tony Kushner had begun writing in the late uh, parts of the Reagan administration and continued, and it finally debuted in the Clinton administration, interestingly enough. Within this kind of microcosm of relationship, Tony Kushner then goes on to explore politics, philosophy, religion, of the power of, of God or the lack of power. At one point he even says, you know, we should take um, up uh, and sue God for abandonment. Did you die? No, I'm here on business. <laughs> and certainly people that were dealing with AIDS at the time and losing their friends felt that God had abandoned them. And yet there was this hopeful message that Tony Kushner created because prior does survive. We had gone from the, the, the uh, killing fields of the normal heart to AZT and the fact that it would continue, that the, you know, the tribe would continue, gay men would continue and gay women would continue and, and there, were, there was a great deal of compassion and conciliation within the play as well. One of the subplots of Angels in America was the story of Harper the wife, who was obviously very unfulfilled because her husband, in fact, loved her, but not as a husband would love a wife. And so she felt very um, inadequate, to say the least. And she became a drug addict and, and so on. I remember seeing this initially, and I had some feeling of identification with her because it, it was kind of revelatory that when people are forced in the closet and therefore have marriages for show, the other person also suffers. So this dealt with so, so many themes, and it won the Pulitzer. 
it won every award you in the book. Pop. But you brought up a very good point, which is that when, and, and this is central to a lot of gay plays, when there is repression, the id leaks out in the most damaging ways, and there's a lot of collateral damage. And you brought that point up beautifully. It was wrong of me to marry you. I knew you. It's a sin, and it's killing us both. The other thing that is lovely about um, Angels in America is the relationship between Pryor and Joe Pitt's Mormon mother. Um, and that was at one point, uh, she says, um, don't make assumptions about me and I won't make assumptions about you. And that is the beginning of a beautiful relationship between, between the two of them that lasts until the end of the play. So that again was Tony Kushner's talking about communicate, connect, just open your, your hearts and your minds to people that you don't think you're gonna get along with. You'll find my friend that what you love will take you places you never dreamed you'd go. I think the last line of Angels in America, which says the great work continues, the great work continues in gay playwrights and lesbian playwrights and transgendered actors. I know that you feel moving forward, Fun Home is something that is a very significant production. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, our sisters, our lesbian sisters, have gotten short shrift in the theater. Uh, for some reason, everything seemed to generate toward gay relationships, male relationships. The, the miracle, the great miracle of Fun Home was that, again, it started at the public theater, where a lot of these plays started, and it was nurtured very carefully with Lisa Krohn and Janine Tesori taking this Alison Bechdel uh, graphic comic that she had created about her father, who was a gay man, a closeted gay man, having to deal with that as she herself is coming out of the closet and, uh, you know, falling in love in college. And I, it goes to the point that you had made earlier that repression, when, when it is there, it leaks out in damaging ways and Bruce commits, ultimately commits suicide. And it's a young woman trying to come to terms with her father's closeted personality and persona and what it leads to. My dad and I both grew up in the same small Pennsylvania town. And he was gay and I was gay and he killed himself. And I became a lesbian cartoonist. And then you have black playwrights like Jeremy O. Harris, who is addressing interracial black and white relationships in plays like The Slave Play and in Daddy, uh, which recently had a run off Broadway. And you have writers like Terrell Alvin McCraney addressing what homophobia is and homosexuality is within the black community. I know that we've left out some of the fantastic musicals that deal with LGBTQ uh, issues. Rent, La Cage au Fall, Kinky Boots. Kinky Boots. Uh, that's Harvey, uh, again, to some extent. It's, it's great that Harvey has become quote unquote mainstream. I don't know if he would think of himself as mainstream, but I think what you have to acknowledge is the great debt that we owe these playwrights gay and lesbian, and these transgendered actors that, we've, uh, that have now been in plays like Gene Lee's Straight White Men. I think what's important is to acknowledge the great bravery of these writers and actors as we've progressed from Mark Crowley to Harvey Firestein to Larry Kramer to Tony Kushner to Matthew Lopez to Terrell Alvin McCraney, et cetera, and so forth because it was hard to be out there, certainly in the early years. Um, it, it was not easy. It could have invited, I'm sure it invited lots of hate mail. Uh, and yet they continued because it was important for this community to have a voice and to show it in all of its prismatic uh, beauty. So as Tony Kushner wrote, the great work continues. Yes, amen to that. <laughs> This is Donna Hanover with Patrick Pacheco and American Theatre After Stonewall. Please join us every Friday night in the month of June for more Stonewall at 50, a CUNY TV digital series celebrating Pride 2019.